For two years, Asante McGee was the girlfriend of the now-disgraced R&B superstar R. Kelly. Her story was featured in the Lifetime docuseries Surviving R. Kelly. She says she was first tested by the singer in the summer of 2016. She was flown to Chicago, locked in a van from sunup to sundown. When I got to the studio, I called him, I texted him, I said, I'm here. So he called me. Okay, my is going to come and open the sprinter. So he comes and opens the sprinter and turns the sprinter on. So I'm sitting on the sprinter thinking he's about to come on the sprinter and we're about to go somewhere. I was has passed by. I'm just on the phone talking to my friends, not realizing. And I had to use the restroom. So I text him and say, Dad, I have to use the restroom. He never responded. Remind you, I got to the studio at 10, 8, about 10.30, 11 a.m. His did not come and get me till 8 p.m. that night and said, Mr. Kelly said, come inside the studio. Joining me now is Asante McGee. She's written a book about her experience. It's called No Longer Trapped in the Closet. Um, so much to talk to you about. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, that particular incident that you're speaking of, um, something caught my attention right away. You said you texted him and said, Daddy, can I use the restroom? Was that what you called him? Was that a common thing to ask permission to even use the restroom? Yes. Um, in the beginning, that was something that he told me that we, I had to address him as Daddy. And so anytime that I would call him or text him, I always had to say daddy before so, asking. So that was a test. What do you mean by that? Um, I later found out a couple of months later that it was a test to see, I guess, my loyalty to him, to see if I guess if I was ready to be considered a living girlfriend. So he, um, because I stayed there all those hours and didn't complain and didn't leave, then I pretty much passed the test. Okay, so I want you to clarify that because, okay, so you're 35 when you meet him. You're older. You're not a teenager. You're 35 years old. Um, you go from a fly-in to a live-in. Can you talk about the difference? Um, yes, the difference, you're able to fly in, come and go as you please. Um, he would text you and say, hey, I'm going to be in this city. Uh, I want you to fly out to this city. So it's times that I would go to the city, won't even see him or just see him at the concert. And so when you live in with him, then you're actually with him and whoever else is living in the house. And that's when all of the rules are actually put in place. So you were, he was paying for you to fly all over the place and yes. just kind of wait around until he wanted to see you, yes. essentially. Um, you lived in the house for three weeks only? Yes. Only three weeks. Okay, how many other women were there in the house with you? At the time, it was two other women at the house. What, what was your relationship like? I mean, did you love him? Oh, definitely. I did love him. Did you think of him as your boyfriend? Yes, I did. What about the other women? Um, I guess it was just something that he was really honest with. He told me about the other women, so it was something that I actually accepted. You accepted? Yes. Um, can you talk about the black room? I know that's something that you were very hesitant to talk about in the docuseries. Is that something you still can't address? I can't because it would actually trigger bad memories and I'm not ready to revisit it. When did you decide you had to get out of there? Because three weeks it doesn't seem like a long time, but it seems like whatever happened in those three weeks, you felt trapped enough to want to get out as soon as possible. Um, by the second week, I actually started planning my getaway. And so because I've actually been in the history of abuse, then I was able to recognize the abuse sooner than others. And so just knowing the things that he was telling me and controlling and just not, I was just being a prison, a prisoner in his house. So I just knew that wasn't right. Have you been in touch with him since you've left? Um, no. Do you think of him as a predator? Yes. Did you reach out to the uh, parents of some of the girls who are still in the situation like you were in? I did. Um, once I left, that was one of the first things. I say about a month or two after I left, I had to gather my thoughts and see what I needed to do. And I contacted those parents to let them know, you know, their daughters are with him and what I experienced and as well as what I've witnessed. How are you doing now? Not good. I mean, it's off and on. I'm trying to maintain my sanity, but it's times that I break down that I just want to just lock up in a room. So you've written this book. I know you've, he has accused you of just trying to make money off of this book or other people who've criticized you for writing this book. What do you say to them? Um, it's not about money for me. I felt because of the criticism that I received that I needed to give people a little history of my background to find out how I actually ended up with a, a man like him. And so because I always hear a lot of people say, oh, she's old enough. I don't feel sorry for her because she knew what she was getting herself into. So I felt like because if they understood my history of abuse, they understand why I was so vulnerable to him.
Okay. All right. Well, Asante, thank you so much for being here. Um, you can get her book, I believe, on Amazon right now and read more about her experience or check out the docuseries. Thank you again um, and uh, safe travels back to Atlanta. All right. Thank you so much.